We form a lot of our ideas about history based on what we see in movies and television. This is understandable. Movies seem more alive, more present than the dry textbook version of history we first learn in school. Rather than reading about things people experienced, you can watch people having experiences. Watch how it affects them, watch how they feel about it, feel empathy for them. Even for people who love to read, even for those who enjoy digging through old newspapers and know what the hell microfiche is, the power of filmed media is hard to deny. Which is more immediately relatable? A text printed in a dead language? Or Michael Fassbender having sexy, sexy emotions right in front of you? But there is a big problem with allowing film to shape our views of history. When we view a lot of history on film, it becomes all too easy to view history through the rules of storytelling. History becomes a movie, with heroes and villains and recurring themes. And this means that a lot of people and events fall onto the cutting room floor. In our views about how the world was, and subsequently how the world is now, get funneled through a very narrow lens. Let's look at an example. During this episode, we're going to look at a movement that existed during one of the 20th century's most commonly portrayed moments. This movement has been almost entirely forgotten, in part because it doesn't fit easily into the filmed narratives of the time. When you think of the end of the Second World War, what comes to mind? Ticker tape parades, soldiers coming home, a joyous kiss. Or maybe it will be something more mournful, like a man staring at the horizon, or reflecting years later over the graves of those he fought with, pondering the nature of war or thoughtful text over soaring music telling you how these brave soldiers lived out their lives. Or sometimes, if you're producing a miniseries and have lots of time to fill, you'll do more than one of these. We see these visions of the end of the war everywhere. In blockbusters, in kids' movies, in video games. They all give you a sense that once the war was done, it was done. You feel like soldiers flew right home, embraced their loved ones, built their lives, made a bunch of baby boomers, and then reflected on and were changed by their experiences. And this is accurate to a degree. For example, that off-portrayed kiss did really happen, though it's come out over the years that it wasn't really romantic or terribly consensual. Regardless, the ticker tape parades and reunions and reflections make excellent film endings, but it was not the reality for many people. Let's dig into that reality. On September 2nd, 1945, when Japan surrendered to the Allied forces, there were millions of active duty military members abroad worldwide. They celebrated the official conclusion of the war and couldn't wait to get back to their families and start living that sweet suburban lifestyle. Now, I do want to make a brief detour here. I found these clips in a, um documentary released by the War Department. This is not directly related to what I'm discussing, but old pieces and documentaries and newsreels like this do provide us with a lot of our images of the times, and a lot of filmmakers end up being inspired by them. This um, documentary makes the following claim. The permanently wounded physically, 1% of all returning servicemen. Those with severe emotional disorders, 1% of all returning servicemen. But returning with them, the huge majority group, the unhurt physically or mentally, the average returning soldier. Now you could look at the angry, sometimes heartbreaking comments below this video and strongly suspect that that 1% number is absolute complete nonsense. And we do actually have data on this. It wasn't one person in 100, it was more like one in 20 who suffered trauma. I really wanted to mention this, because the idea that most people are able to face war bravely without consequence is really toxic. For both those who survive war, and for the culture at large. We gain nothing good by claiming inhuman bravery in the face of horror. Also, what a fun coincidence that they managed to get pictures of the same people leaving and returning from the war. Okay, back on topic. Getting millions of people scattered around the globe home was a task that would prove somewhat difficult. The U.S. government was quick to point out that they only had so many ships to transport people home. So a few months before the end of the war, when the U.S. government was anticipating surrender, 
the military set up a point system. Soldiers were given points for things like years in service, experience in difficult combat theaters, number of dependent children, etc. The soldiers with the highest point counts would be sent home first. At least, in theory. In practice, the point system seemed to be all over the place. It seemed like people in skilled positions were being kept in despite high point counts. Many black soldiers with high point counts were kept overseas longer than white soldiers with lower point counts. And often people who had served for long stretches in Europe and were therefore supposedly exempt from long foreign service were sent back to Japan anyway with seemingly no explanation. This was further exacerbated when high-profile film celebrities like Robert Taylor and Tyrone Power were able to leave right after the war was finished to continue their Hollywood contracts. The point system was also stacked against non-white soldiers from the beginning. Due to racism in the upper levels of the army, most black soldiers were not trusted with combat roles, and thus were not awarded combat points, and thus had lower point counts, and thus would return home last. Soldiers were not thrilled with this whole situation, and began to speak up about it pretty quickly. Here's an article from August 21st, 1945, two weeks before Japanese surrender, about the 95th Division of the Army. They were protesting being sent to Japan for occupation duty and sent telegrams to Congress. In the article, Commanding Officer Major General Harry Twaddle, solid name, attempts to calm people by saying that the Army is not sending anyone to overseas service that has more than 75 discharge points. However, the article notes that previously, the military had stated it would only send back people who had not seen excessive combat. So it's understandable that the 95th, who had already spent a long time fighting in Europe, were not wild about the idea of leaving home to occupy Japan. It likely felt like the army was cheating by changing the rules on them. Two days later, on August 23rd, the 97th Infantry Division wrote protests and chalk on the side of rail cars. These rail cars were carrying them to the west coast, from which they'd be sent to Japan. They had also spent significant time fighting in Europe. This battalion sent a letter to a local reporter who joined them on the train and was then arrested by army officers who apparently didn't agree with the protest. The reporters were released and the officers made the battalion wash the messages off the cars. The protests written on the side of the train included things like, we're being sold down the river while Congress vacations and why do we go from here? That last one, why do we go from here is really interesting. The United States knew that Japan was on its last legs and was about to surrender, and Germany had surrendered months before. So why, when they should have been focusing on getting people home, were they sending people away? As I mentioned briefly before, this was primarily for occupation duty. The treaties that ended World War II specified that a certain number of troops would stay behind in Germany and Japan to keep an eye on things. What does a conquering army do with 70 million people? What does a conquering army do with the family of the Japanese soldier? Fathers, brothers, mothers, cousins of the soldier. There were constant disagreements between U.S. President Truman and his generals about how many people would be required for this. Estimates ranged between 200,000 and 2.5 million people, the latter number being favored by President Truman and the War Department. Now, 2.5 million is a whole lot of people. For reference, the U.S. Army right now only has about 1.3 million people in it, and we're currently in roughly 150 countries. So why on earth would we need this many people to stay behind? Well, U.S. soldiers were not just staying in Germany and Japan. For example, large numbers of soldiers were stationed in the Philippines, which had been conquered by Japanese forces, but whom the U.S. had not been in direct combat with. In fact, a large number of Filipinos had fought the Japanese alongside U.S. forces. So why were they being occupied? Some saw this as an attempt for the U.S. to reestablish the Philippines as a United States territory, which it had been for a time before the Second World War. Or perhaps the U.S. was looking to set up bases in the region to keep an eye on not just Japan, but some other powers in the region. Even more interestingly, 
As angry letters from GIs who wanted to come home began to flood U.S. newspapers, many of them reported being stationed in China, who had been an ally of the U.S. in the fight against Japan. So why on earth was the U.S. stationing people in China? One letter from Private Harry Anderson, published in an Indiana newspaper, describes his frustration. We all had an opportunity to discuss our gripes to our commanding officer, and the two main ones were, one, when do we go home? Two, why are we in China? Of course, he had an answer, I'm wondering too. Other GIs were more accusatory about U.S. motives. This letter was published by columnist Bill Cunningham and was signed by nine soldiers. Why are we in China? To disarm Japanese troops, as we were told? Surely not, because we stand guard daily with armed Japanese. To safeguard American lives and interests? No. The only Americans we have seen besides ourselves are Red Cross personnel. The only interests we have seen is one dilapidated shell gasoline pump. The military and political leaders may be able to shove that down civilian throats, but not ours. We see what is happening out there. Our sentries have been shot at by Chinese communists. Why should any more American lives be sacrificed by butting into something that is no concern of ours? We sure as hell wouldn't like it if China sent troops to the United States to forcefully hold one of our political parties in check. Let the Chinese settle their own difficulties. Now this is semi-speculatory, but given that there was a struggle between communist and right-wing forces in China at the time, and given that the U.S. had not been overly friendly towards communism before World War II, and engaged in a half-century-long conflict with communists after it ended, and were to topple lots and lots and lots of governments that seemed even vaguely communist, it's not a huge leap to say that maybe they were interested in intervening in China, which again, was a government we had just allied with. The U.S. was interested in toppling communism, securing capitalism globally, and securing U.S. economic security. Capital investment in underdeveloped regions. This program is in the interest of all peoples and has nothing in common with either the old imperialism of the last century or the new imperialism of the communists. This is something familiar to anyone who follows modern U.S. foreign policy. But this policy of occupation seemed absurd to many GIs in the 40s. Lots of soldiers were not terribly happy with occupation duty, seeing it as boring, useless, and not what they had signed up to do. They had been happy to make sacrifices when they were fighting against fascism and the Nazis, but staying away from their families to sit around on random bases or engage in more dubious conflicts wasn't sitting well, especially because the War Department was sending mixed messages about its motives. They began to write to newspapers en masse. If you look at newspapers from late 1945, they are full of letters like this. Here's an entry from a man stationed in Manila that references those happy ticker tape parades the movies all told us about. We are told that a pathetic trickle of men is returning to the States, but the news of victory parades and celebrations comes to us as distantly as one might hear his own funeral. So yeah, not exactly a cheerful homecoming for Mr. Neelands there. As the months dragged on and soldiers stayed where they were, military newspapers, that is, papers written by and for those in military service, began to get more and more radical. Soldiers began to be vocal about their dislike of occupation duty, complained openly about how the military claimed to not have enough ships to send people home, but was using ships to transport equipment and soldiers for other conflicts. They began openly questioning the officer structure, mocking officers by calling them upper-class brass hats, and discussing how most of occupation duties seemed to involve running errands for officers. These newspapers also began to publish letters from soldiers that were very critical of Truman's foreign policy goals. Here's an excerpt from a letter from Private First Class William D. Simpkins. What kind of government is this? And what are we to scream piously, the world must be free, then keep it to ourselves? Here's maybe my favorite letter that I'm going to read to you today, and you've noticed I'm reading a lot of letters. This one was published in the Daily Pacifican and was also sent to President Truman. It was signed by the 250 African-American soldiers who made up the 823rd Engineer Aviation Battalion. 
It is against our American character and heritage to take the field and lead with the alien rulers against the freedom revolts of oppressed peoples. We do not want to be associated with British imperialist mercenaries in shooting and bombing to death the free emerge of the peoples of the Southeast Asiatic countries. We do not want to unify China with bayonets and bombing planes and American lives. Several soldiers based around the Pacific started a campaign called No Boats, No Votes. They stamped letters with the slogan and sent them back to papers and politicians at home. Meaning, if the United States did not bring in boats to carry them home, the soldiers wouldn't support any representatives. And people back home began to petition their representatives too. Many servicemen's wives nationwide formed nearly 200 Bring Bad Daddy clubs. These awesome clubs staged demonstrations on Capitol Hill, including mailing hundreds of baby booties to members of Congress, with attached notes that said, Bring back my daddy. One congressman claimed that this was a shameful waste of shoes. He also said that women folks couldn't understand the problem, which, cool. There was a lot of discussion in Congress about demobilization, lots of posturing in the press, but nothing was actually getting done. And American soldiers worldwide were getting angrier and angrier. As early as September, good old General Twaddle had tried to deliver a speech to soldiers regarding the slowdown of demobilization plans, and was so overwhelmed by booze, it took 40 minutes to deliver a 15-minute speech. It became clearer and clearer as the end of the year approached that most GIs would not be home with their families by Christmas. And this pissed people off a lot. The letters published in papers began to get a little bit intense. Here's an excerpt from one signed simply, A Serviceman. Time was when my children would have fared well on Christmas. I had a good job for which I spent years in preparation. Now, only a year and a half later, I have only a few points and cannot get out of the service. I have been forgotten by the War Department and the nation, so have thousands of fathers in similar straits. But my son doesn't know this, nor does my daughter. They still want clothes. They still want to enjoy Christmas. They cannot seem to understand it when I say that we are too poor, that Daddy, who works so hard from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., doesn't have enough money to buy them Christmas gifts all the other children have. My daughter, being older, is wiser. Isn't the war over, she asked? Then why do daddies have to stay in the army? And I can't tell her, any more than I can tell her why Santa Claus is going to forget her this year. I don't want help. I want someone to explain this to my daughter, to look her square in the eyes and tell her exactly why her father cannot return to her. Is there anyone in this land of the free who can do that? So yeah, things were getting tense. This was also made way worse by the fact that some officers got to fly home for the holidays, while the enlisted didn't. People began to take serious action. In Manila on Christmas Day, 1945, 4,000 GIs marched in protest of a cancel trip home, carrying banners that read, We want ships. Anyone who's ever tried to organize a protest knows that 4,000 people is a pretty good turnout. But this was kind of buried in the news. Like, you might notice these are kind of small articles with no pictures that are sort of hidden in side columns or in the back of the paper. In Washington, President Truman and his administration were trying to figure out how the hell to calm the troops down. General Marshall suggested using army priests and chaplains to bring them down to a philosophical acceptance of where their duty lies. Okay, so using religious guilt to pound people into submission, that's a time-honored tactic. General Eisenhower and President Truman continued to insist to Congress and the American people that a large overseas occupying force was necessary. And the good old New York Times published an op-ed on December 31st that said bringing too many people home would endanger the peace. So the holidays came and went, and 1945 became 1946. 1946 is our year of decision. We cannot shirk leadership in the post-war world. The men and women who made this country great and kept it free were plain people with courage and faith. Let us justify this heritage. In the first days of January 1946, the government made a small announcement. They were going to slow down demobilization 
and keep people in the field for longer. Our overseas forces would be dangerously under strength in occupying hostile countries if all eligible men were to be returned before sufficient replacements arrived. People lost their minds. For the next few weeks, soldiers marched in protest all over the world. 12,000 marched in Manila. In Guam, 18,000 attended rallies and 3,500 went on hunger strikes. There were massive rallies of 20,000 in Hawaii. In France, soldiers marched down the Champs-Élysées. 4,000 men in Germany stormed headquarters and tried to get into generals' offices. In London, 500 people managed to get into former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's hotel and demanded answers from the only authority figure they could find. Hell, even in Maryland and Pennsylvania, people left their posts in solidarity. Truman tried his best not to comment. But dissent was no longer buried. It was all over the papers, on the front pages even. Eventually, commenting became inevitable. Truman simply shortly stated that there was an inescapable need for soldiers overseas. He said that they were destroying the war-making potential of hostile nations. At a mass meeting in Hawaii, soldiers responded with, We are not destroying the war-making potential of hostile nations by occupying Oahu. Truman was getting a bit wound up that people were protesting the massive military machine he wanted to maintain. Privately, he blamed soft living, like the existence of sheets and heat in training camps. Yes, heat. How luxurious. And the angry feeling started to leak out in public. After a press conference in mid-January, colonist Drew Pearson presented Truman with a petition signed by 30,000 GIs asking to come home. Truman reacted badly. He got in the columnist's face, refused to talk about the GIs, and threatened to punch Pearson over an unrelated puff piece he had written about the First Lady. So whenever Trump is unusually mean to the press, remember that this is a presidential tradition. Generals tried their best to clamp down on protests. Eisenhower gave a speech in Canada attempting to calm people, in which he said that the sentiment from families that soldiers should return home was hurting their morale, and the U.S. must adopt an international viewpoint. So apparently, Eisenhower's thoughts were, the mission is important, so please stop telling your loved ones you miss them. The military chided protesters in the press and at meetings. They told military papers that they had to stop agitating people or they'd be shut down. They shut down meetings. They arrested several people for protesting in Hawaii. But the demonstrators didn't let up. Oftentimes, when people talked about protest movements, especially protests against the upper levels of the American military, they talked about how hopeless they are, how it's a pointless fight. A certain Kurt Vonnegut quote comes to mind. Yet, here's the thing about the Bring Us Home movement. They won. There had been some people here and there who tried to float the idea that communist agitation was the cause of the protests, but given that there were millions of families missing their loved ones in the U.S., this didn't stick. And honestly, they really couldn't speak too badly of the very people they had just spent years valorizing as heroes. Congress opened investigations. The Truman administration went along with it and massively sped up demobilization, sending millions of people home. Truman considered this the biggest regret of his administration, by the way. And while the U.S. retained bases in the Philippines and other countries, the number of people there was scaled down. Most of all, there was no direct military conflict with China. Ordinary people were, if only for a moment, able to reverse the course set out by the upper levels of the War Department. This is significant, is inspiring, and most importantly, is a hell of an underdog story. So why is there not a movie about this? Well, first of all, the political environment immediately after the war was not right for it. After all, the House of Un-American Activities was starting to ramp up, and they were very interested in communistic scripts. Have you ever observed any communistic information in any script? Films about mass protest and mass movements, especially one that could be considered a mutiny against the United States military, 
was uh, not going to get made by studios who were desperate to prove how patriotic they were. Movies about post-war soldiers during this time tended to be about the tough readjustment to civilian life, about missing the army, Gee, I wish I was back in the army. or encouraging people to re-enlist because of readiness. If there was a war on, you wouldn't question any of this. Well, that's just it. There isn't. But there is a kind of war. We've got to stay ready to fight without fighting. People didn't really get more suspicious about U.S. military motives until the 60s and 70s. And by this time, the Bring Us Home movement was already kind of forgotten. Furthermore, there was a much more present war to criticize. In the 80s, we were way into the Reagan era, so our movies were all about money and nationalism. In the 90s, there were lots of movies about World War II, but they tended to be more about revisiting grand sacrifices and the nobility of our last good war. And then 9-11 happened, and we've been on a hyper-nationalistic kick ever since. So the political environment has never been right for this. But not every filmmaker bends to the trends of the times. Why hasn't some enterprising indie filmmaker written a script about this? Well, this comes down to an issue of funding and genre. Many movies about the military are funded by the military. After all, military equipment tends to be massively expensive, so it makes sense for studios to get loans rather than trying to go through all the nonsense that comes when you try to buy a tank. But this comes with a price. Final script approval. Famously, the first Avengers movie was denied that approval. I recognize the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid-ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. And the military wouldn't be invested in making a movie about the Bring Us Home movement. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying this is a government conspiracy. I'm not going to be taking away in a van for telling you about this. But obviously, the military is not going to throw money at a film that tells their soldiers to rebel against officers and demand to be sent home. That's literally the exact opposite of what they're trying to achieve with their Hollywood partnerships. So a script about the Bring Us Home movement wouldn't get military funding, which means the studio will have to buy that tank. And this will be a period piece, so that tank will be incredibly rare and expensive. And this movie won't be like The Avengers, a tentpole superhero film with a bunch of built-in fans and obvious heroes and villains. This is a story about how the U.S. government failed the people who helped them liberate Europe because of their own imperialistic ambitions. This is a messy, complicated story. It's not a rah-rah America movie, which means it will be controversial, which means you're cutting your audience share and potential earnings in half. Furthermore, this movie is missing a big action sequence in the third act, which means it isn't really a war movie. It bends genres. It's a risk. And in this environment, when studios are spending money on fewer and fewer films, they aren't going to spend big blockbuster money on a risky, potentially alienating, genre-bending period piece that requires a large cast, location shooting, and working tanks from the 1940s. There's a reason a lot of the cool, award-winning movies tend to be about people hanging out in apartments or restaurants or on the beach. It's because you can afford to take risks when you don't cost too much. This is what happens when history is learned on film, a medium subject to both government and market forces. Things inconvenient for the government or for the market get edited out. So we need to share this story and others like it ourselves. After all, Truman did eventually get his way and build that giant military machine. My fellow Americans, I want to talk to you plainly tonight about what we're doing in Korea and about our policy in the Far East. And we're still feeling the effects of this today. I think a story about how the government can't keep soldiers trapped in an endless, miserable conflict might speak to some people, I don't know. And obviously it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. People in the 40s had more experience with unions, and in fact, many of the soldiers who protested were inspired by unions. And the military of the 40s was heavily drafted, whereas now people opt in. But I think a lot of people would be open to this message. It might be nice to tell someone that just because a recruiter promised them he could buy a Dodge Charger when he was 17, they have options besides just going back to Afghanistan over and over and over again. And it might be nice to tell the person who joined up in a bid for citizenship that they don't have to go to the border and ruin the lives of people trying to get citizenship. People have power when we organize. And we need to tell each other that. 
over and over again. So the next time you watch a movie about history, take a moment to wonder about the movements and people not deemed significant enough to script and wonder what those people could teach us.